building. Go to backyard, six feet beyond. We're waiting. God chose us. Sharon Faye Smith was born on June 25, 1967, to Bob and Hilda Smith. They called her Sherry for short. She was the middle child in between her older sister Dawn and her younger brother Robert. She was very happy and very kind-hearted. She excelled in school and was a gifted singer. They described her as the glue that held the family together. In 1985, the Smith family lived in Lexington, South Carolina. Lexington is 15 miles west of South Carolina's capital, Columbia, and in 1985 had a population of less than 5,000 people. The Smiths lived in a particularly rural section of Lexington off of Platt Spring Road. Bob Smith was a pastor at a local church and Hilda worked as a Sunday school teacher, also raising their three kids. Sherry and Don were only three years apart in age and had a close relationship. They loved to play the piano and sing together. They both had dreams of becoming Christian music stars. Sherry and Don were both blonde, blue-eyed, and strikingly beautiful. In the summer of 1985, Sherry was getting ready to graduate from Lexington High School. She had just completed her finals and was excited that she was going to be attending Columbia College in the fall. Sherry had a big weekend in front of her. She was graduating that Sunday and then leaving for the Bahamas on a cruise for a senior trip with her friends. Sherry was even set to sing the national anthem during her graduation ceremony. On Friday, May 31st, Sherry had a busy day. After finishing her last final in the morning, Sherry, her boyfriend Richard, and her friend Brenda went to run errands to prepare for their weekend. First, they met up with Sherry's mom, Hilda, to buy some traveler's checks for her upcoming trip. After that, the trio went to a friend's pool party to have some fun and get some relief from the scorching summer heat. Sherry was extremely excited about all of the upcoming events. Her friends recall that she was a very positive, bubbly person and that she was the friend to go to if you were down and needed a shoulder to cry on. Sherry was extremely responsible and considerate. At 2.30 p.m., she called home to her mother to tell her that she was leaving the pool party. Her boyfriend Richard left at the same time and they sat in her car for about 15 minutes. At 2.45 p.m., they kissed goodbye and he followed Sherry out to the main road before he turned off into a different direction to head home. On the way home, Sherry stopped at a local drugstore to pick up some items for her upcoming trip. Unbeknownst to Sherry, a man sat motionless in his car, studying her every move. At 3.38 p.m., Sherry turned onto her long driveway on Platte Springs Road. It was her routine every day to stop and check the mailbox. The Smith's driveway was about 750 feet long and led up from the main road to the Smith's home. Sherry's father, Bob, looked out the window from his office and yelled to Hilda, Sherry's home. He then turned his attention back to his work. After several minutes had gone by and Sherry hadn't entered the door, Bob looked out the window again and saw Sherry's car was still at the end of the driveway with the driver's side door hanging open. Alarmed, he got out, jumped in his car, and sped down the end of the driveway to see if everything was okay. When Bob reached Sherry's blue Chevette, he immediately knew that something was very wrong. The car was still running and Sherry was nowhere in sight. Her purse and black jelly shoes were sitting on the passenger seat. Sherry's towel from the pool party laid damp across her seat and the medicine that had to be with her at all times was nestled in her purse. Bob then noticed that their mail was scattered all over the ground next to the mailbox. There was a set of bare footprints leading away from the car, but none coming back. In a panic, he immediately started screaming for Sherry and yelled up to Hilda to call the police and report her missing. The sheriff's office responded to the Smith's home almost immediately. The Smiths explained that with Sherry's rare form of diabetes, she was in a grave situation without her medication. Law enforcement knew it was a race against the clock and immediately began searches for Sherry Faye Smith. Law enforcement and volunteer searchers then launched the largest search in South Carolina history at that time. They had extensive ground searches despite the blistering 100-degree heat. 
Sherry's disappearance was front page news and the citizens of Lexington were shocked that this could happen in their quiet, close-knit town. Despite days of intensive searches, investigators couldn't find any trace of Sherry. The Lexington County Sheriff's Office started interviewing neighbors and people in the area to see if anyone had noticed anything strange on the afternoon of the 31st. On the afternoon that Sherry was kidnapped, two men happened to be driving by and saw Sherry getting out of her car and walking over to the mailbox. As they drove by, they passed a reddish vehicle that looked similar to an Oldsmobile Cutlass. About 10 minutes later, they drove back by and they saw Sherry's car running with the car door wide open, but no Sherry. All they remembered about the man in the vehicle was that he appeared to be in his 30s. For several days, the Smith sat restless, completely distraught and frustrated that they had no control over what was happening and they also had no idea what was happening to Sherry. On June 2nd, three days after Sherry's disappearance, the Smith's phone rang at 2.30 a.m. Bob answered the phone and a man with what sounded like a distorted voice asked to speak with Hilda. The man on the phone stated that he had kidnapped Sherry and apologized for taking her. To prove that he had taken Sherry, he described the clothes she was wearing, including her black and yellow swimsuit that she was wearing under her clothes. He assured Hilda that Sherry was alive and well and that they were watching TV together. He stated that he was not calling for money and that he was going to return Sherry to her family. He then told Hilda that she would be getting a letter the next day and he would call back. Hilda tried to get him to stay on the line, but he hung up. A phone tap had already been set up by investigators. However, the caller hung up before it could be traced. Excited that this could finally be their first big lead, investigators drove over to the postmaster's home and woke him up. They told him to open the post office so they could go through all of the incoming mail. Bob Smith insisted on coming with them to look for the letter. As investigators sifted through the sea of white envelopes, they finally found what they had been looking for a letter addressed to the Smith family. It was written on a yellow legal pad. Bob was the first to read the letter and he became extremely distraught as he recognized Sherry's handwriting and read the words, last will and testament across the top. The initial excitement of finding the letter quickly turned to shock and horror as they read the contents. The letter was dated June 1st at 3.10 a.m. It read in part, I love you, mommy, daddy, Robert, Don, and Richard, and everyone else and all friends and relatives. I'll be with my father now, so please don't worry. Just remember my witty personality and great special times we all shared together. Please don't let this ruin your lives and just keep living one day at a time. She also wrote, sorry about the cruise money. Please send someone else in my place. Then, to everyone's horror, Sherry had written the words, casket closed. Investigators couldn't fathom a 17-year-old having to write a goodbye letter and think about her own funeral, knowing that she was likely going to die after she wrote it. It just went to show how amazingly strong that Sherry was as she was trying to comfort her family in such a horrific moment. The letter was immediately sent to the South Carolina Law Enforcement Crime Lab, there, it will be examined by a forensic document examiner for any clues, fibers, fingerprints, or handprints, or any discrepancies in the spelling or handwriting. Analyzing the letter would take weeks, so in the meantime, they prayed that Sherry's abductor would call back. Every minute felt like it stretched on for hours. The sheriff's office then fully turned the case over to the FBI so they could use all of their resources to find Sherry before it was too late. Despite the contents of the letter, they still had faith and held out hope that Sherry would be returned alive. Later that evening, the Smiths received yet another call. This one, however, was much darker than all of the others. Why two or three days? Call the search off. 
This time, investigators were able to trace the call, but by the time they got there, the man was gone. On June 4th, the Smiths received yet another call. This time, Sherry's older sister, Dawn, spoke to Sherry's captor. He told her that at 3.10 a.m. on Saturday, June 1st, Sherry wrote the letter. Then at 4.58 a.m., he said that they, quote, became one soul. When Dawn asked specifically what he meant by that, he told her not to ask any questions. The man was clearly enjoying toying with Sherry's family and refusing to tell them whether or not Sherry was okay. 4.58 a.m. No, I'm sorry, hold on. 3.10 a.m. Saturday, the first of June, she hand wrote what you received. 4.58 a.m. Saturday, the first of June. Okay, Saturday, the first of June. On Wednesday, June 5th, around noon, he called back yet again. This time, he told them that they could go see Sherry. He told Hilda to listen carefully and then proceeded to give detailed directions to a specific location. He ended the call by saying, We're waiting. God chose us. Detectives followed the directions he provided. Hilda begged to go along, but they convinced her it would not be a good idea. What they found had confirmed everybody's worst fears. Sherry's body was exactly where the man said it would be, behind an old Masonic lodge in Saluda County, 18 miles west of the Smith's home. The autopsy showed that Sherry had been dead for four days. In fact, the medical examiner estimated that she had been killed about 12 hours after being kidnapped. The coroner was unable to determine the cause of her death because of advanced decomposition and being left outside in the extremely hot temperatures. However, a residue of duct tape on Sherry's face suggested that she had died of suffocation. Pieces of her hair had been cut off because the tape had gotten stuck in it. Because of the state of Sherry's body, no forensic evidence was recovered. They could not definitively prove whether or not Sherry had been assaulted. When the man said on the phone that he and Sherry had, quote, become one soul on June 1st at 4.58 a.m., detectives assumed this was the exact time that he had killed her. The calls to the Smith home had just been a sick game to get their hopes up, even though Sherry had been dead the entire time. FBI agents John Douglas and Ron Walker of the Behavioral Science Unit were asked to come up with a detailed profile of Sherry's killer to assist investigators in narrowing down the suspects and to better understand what kind of man they were looking for. They categorized him as an organized killer. He was sophisticated in his methods and had been planning this murder for a while. It was highly likely that he had committed crimes of a similar nature before, and they were certain that he would kill again. According to their profile, he would be in his mid to late 20s or early 30s, white, unattractive, and overweight. He had likely been married, but was now divorced or separated. He was of above average intelligence with a knowledge of electronics, given that he had altered his voice for most of the phone calls. They also did not think that he was impulsive or one to take many chances. From listening to the recordings of the phone calls, the FBI agents and detectives working the case were convinced that he was reading from some type of script that he had written. They noticed that sometimes during the phone calls, he would stumble and go back to the beginning of a sentence and start over, saying the exact same phrase again. The profilers also believed that the killer would be feeling exhilarated and powerful since he had gotten away with Sherry's murder. Even after Sherry's body was found, her killer was not done rubbing salt in the Smith family's wounds. He especially enjoyed speaking to Dawn on the phone, which terrified Bob and Hilda. Investigators recognized he was becoming fixated on her as well. Right before Sherry's funeral, the killer called the Smith home again. Dawn answered, and he told her that he was planning to turn himself in the next day, but was also contemplating taking his own life. He then asked for their forgiveness. He explained to Dawn that he had been watching Sherry for about two weeks. 
sometimes he would mix up Don and Sherry during the phone calls. He accidentally said during this phone call that everything had just gotten out of hand and that, quote, all he wanted was to make love to Don. When Don questioned this, he corrected himself, saying he meant Sherry. When the Smith family got home from Sherry's funeral, they were emotionally spent and completely exhausted. As they got ready for bed, Sherry's killer called yet again that day. Displaying just how sadistic he was, he called collect. When Don answered the phone, the operator asked if they would accept a collect call from Sherry Smith. Once again, he spoke to Don and chose this night to be particularly cruel. He described to Don the details of Sherry's death, including the various and disgusting ways that he had assaulted her. He disclosed that he had been watching Sherry for weeks and was able to get her into his car at gunpoint that day while she was checking the mail. He also described how absolutely terrified Sherry was after he abducted her. He told Don that he let Sherry choose the exact time that she would die. He also stated that he gave her the choice of dying by shooting, a drug overdose, or suffocation. According to the killer, Sherry chose suffocation. Did you tell her you were going to kill her? Yes, I did, and I gave her the choice, and she picked suffocation. My God, how could you? He also told Don that Sherry didn't put up a fight or a struggle while he wrapped duct tape around her head, suffocating and killing her right there in front of him. Despite how unbelievably traumatized Dawn was, she forced herself to keep the conversation going long enough for investigators to trace the call. She was determined to help catch her sister's killer. As the days went by, the citizens in the town of Lexington became even more on edge. Many children who normally spent the summers riding bikes or running around with their friends were ordered to stay inside near their parents. June 14, 1985, was another blistering hot and sunny day. Nine-year-old Deborah May Helmick and her brother were playing in their front yard in Richland County, which is about 25 miles from the Smiths' home. Their father was sitting inside the house while they played. Deborah was a pretty blonde, blue-eyed little girl, very similar in looks to Sherry. As they were playing, a man in a Buick pulled up, snatched Deborah right out of her yard in broad daylight, and threw her in his car. A neighbor saw the abduction and heard her screams and tried to run after the car, but he quickly pulled away. When investigators heard about Deborah's abduction, they were convinced it was Sherry's killer. They decided to try and come up with a plan to draw the killer out. The agents thought that they may be able to lure him out of hiding with a memorial service for Sherry at the cemetery, with Don playing a central role, given that he was obviously very fond of her. He would be paying close attention to the media, carefully consuming every story related to Sherry and Deborah. If the local media made a big enough story out of the memorial service, there was an excellent chance that he would attend, stand in the back, and silently watch. Members of the community came from far and wide to support the Smiths. At the instructions of Agent Douglas, Don brought a small stuffed koala bear, Sherry's favorite animal, to lay at her sister's grave along with the bouquets of flowers. If Sherry's killer did attend the service, he would see Don with the bear. They were hoping with any luck, he might come back after the service was finished and take the bear as some type of souvenir. Detectives stood in the back hiding, taking down plates of the vehicles that attended the service. Once it was finished, they hid lying in wait for the suspect to appear and take the bear, but he never showed up. For about a week, it was silent. Then, just after midnight on June 23rd, the Smiths got another call. While Sherry's killer had not been brought out in the open by the memorial service, it had clearly stirred something in him. Investigators figured that he did want to go to the service, but he just didn't feel that it was safe. Instead, he satisfied his sick need for attention by calling the Smiths again. Don answered the phone. As he had done a number of times before, he brought God into the conversation. He found playing God to be particularly satisfying. Investigators thought this was because he knew that the Smith family was very religious. One interesting fact that investigators noticed right away and a further indication that he was beginning to feel completely untouchable 
was the fact that he no longer distorted his voice for his phone calls to the Smiths. Don listened on in horror as Sherry's killer said, God wants you to join Sherry Faye. He also told her that it was only a matter of time and that she couldn't be protected forever. He then asked her if she had heard of a girl named Deborah Helmick, except he pronounced her name wrong. At first, Dawn didn't recall, but then she remembered that a little girl had been kidnapped from Richland County. He then rattled off a list of instructions, just as he had done two weeks ago to Hilda when he led her to Sherry's body. He then ended the call by saying, Deborah May is waiting. God forgive us all. Just like they had before, investigators followed the killer's instructions and were horrified to find the badly decomposed remains of nine-year-old Deborah May Helmick. Investigators now knew that they had a sadistic serial killer on the loose, who would likely soon be looking for his next victim. Meanwhile, investigators were about to discover that they had the biggest clue to finding Sherry's killer all along. As forensic analysts reviewed Sherry's last will and testament letter, they used a machine called an electrostatic detection apparatus. Given that the letter was written on paper from a legal pad, they thought that there was a good chance that things the killer had written on previous sheets from the pad could have left indentions on the sheets Sherry wrote her letter on. They used the EDA machine to detect any of these sorts of indentations that were not visible to the naked eye. What the analyst found was exactly what they had hoped for. The machine detected a list of names and telephone numbers. It appeared that it was a call in case of emergency type of list that had been written before the letter. Investigators were elated as this was their first big lead. One of the phone numbers was nearly complete and only missing the final digit. It began with 205, which showed it was an Alabama number. The next three digits, 837, was the exchange for Huntsville. Detectives had nine out of the 10 digits and there were only so many possibilities. They tested the phone number with each of the nine different options for the 10th digit until someone picked up the phone. When a young man answered the phone, detectives asked him if he had any connections to South Carolina. The man told him that yes, he did and that his parents lived there. The young man's father was 50-year-old Ellis Shepard, who lived just 15 miles from the Smith's home. Detectives reviewed the Shepard's phone bills and were able to verify that some of the calls that the killer made to the Smith's home had in fact come from the Shepard's residence. Investigators wondered if they had finally tracked down the sadistic predator that had taken Sherry and Deborah's lives. Detectives immediately headed down to Alabama and paid a visit to Ellis and his wife. However, the Shepherds had an airtight alibi. Ellis told investigators that he had been on vacation with his wife when both Sherry Smith and Deborah Helmick had disappeared. Frustrated, investigators then played the Shepherds a recording of one of the killer's later phone calls to the Smiths in which his voice was not distorted. The shepherds listened to the call and immediately looked at each other with a shocked expression on their face. Ellis looked over at investigators and still in shock stated, that's Larry Jean Bell. They explained that Larry Jean Bell had been house sitting for them while they were away on vacation. Ellis explained that he had left a list of phone numbers for Bell in case of an emergency while they were away. The list included the number of his son who lived in Alabama. During a search of the Shepherd's home, they found six blonde hairs that matched Sherry Smith's. They also found the roll of duck stamps that matched the stamp on Sherry's letter. Slowly piecing things together, the Shepherds recalled that when Bell picked them up from the airport, he was not himself. He seemed extremely nervous and on edge. He hadn't shaved and he had lost a substantial amount of weight. He obsessively talked about the missing girls and had zero interest in any other topics. He had also told the Shepherds that he had been closely following both cases. As investigators dug into their new suspect, they discovered that the profile that the FBI had provided to them was spot on. Larry Jean Bell was a 35-year-old divorced electrician who was currently living with his parents in Lake Murray, South Carolina. 
He had briefly enlisted as a Marine, but was discharged after accidentally shooting himself with a gun while he was cleaning it. He even briefly worked for the Department of Corrections in Columbia, South Carolina. Bell's past included several sexually motivated crimes. In November of 1974, 26-year-old Sandy Elaine Cornett disappeared from her apartment in Charlotte, North Carolina. Sandy was the girlfriend of one of Larry Jean Bell's co-workers. Bell had attended a party at Sandy's apartment prior to her disappearance. Bell was considered a suspect, but never charged. Then in February of 1975, Dale Sauls Howell was walking through a parking lot, heading into a local store to buy some laundry detergent. She noticed a man in a green Volkswagen staring her down. The man got out of the car and said, let's go to Charlotte and party. Dale told him no, and he lunged towards her, grabbing her and pressing a knife against her stomach. Dale started screaming, which attracted the attention of others, and the man took off. The police caught up with him, and Dale came down to the station to identify him. The man's name was Larry Jean Bell. He was charged with assault and battery. Bell pled guilty and received a five-year sentence that was suspended to a five-year probation period. His victim, Dale, was never even told about the hearing. Just a few months later, in July of 1975, 21-year-old Denise Newsom porch was leaving a note for her husband that she was going to go show an apartment to a prospective buyer. She was last seen in the parking lot of the apartment complex having a conversation with an unidentified man. She was never seen again. All of her personal belongings were left behind, including her purse. Larry Jean Bell lived just 300 yards away at the time. Three months after that, in October of 1975, he attempted to kidnap a University of South Carolina student, but she managed to get away. After this attack, his probation was revoked. However, instead of imposing a harsh sentence, he again promised the judge to seek mental health treatment for his attacks and only served two years and was out by 1978. Then in 1979, he was charged with making obscene phone calls. On June 27, 1985, 28 days after kidnapping and murdering Sherry Smith, Larry Jean Bell was arrested at his parents' home in Lake Murray. Bell denied having anything to do with the kidnapping and deaths of Sherry Smith and Deborah Helmick. But rather than just outright denying it, he oddly claimed that it was the bad Larry Jean Bell who was guilty of the murders and that the good Larry Jean Bell would never be capable of these horrific things. In February of 1986, Bell went to trial for the murder of Sherry Faye Smith. He made a scene during his six hour long testimony, yelling and making strange comments like, quote, Mona Lisa is a man and silence is golden, my friend. It was obvious to everyone in the courtroom that he was attempting to manipulate the jury into believing that he was crazy and not responsible for his actions. Unfortunately for Bell, nobody bought it. The jury deliberated for just 47 minutes. They returned verdicts of guilty on both charges of kidnapping and first-degree murder in the case of Sherry Faye Smith. Bell was sentenced to death. He was then tried separately in 1987 for the kidnapping and murder of nine-year-old Deborah May Helmick. The jury in that trial came back with the same verdict, guilty on both counts of kidnapping and first-degree murder. Larry Jean Bell had not only destroyed the Smith and Helmick families, but he had instilled absolute terror amongst the citizens of South Carolina. The fear of that summer never fully went away. In 1986, Sherry's sister Dawn competed in the Miss South Carolina pageant as Sherry had always encouraged her to do. She sang for the talent portion of the competition. As I pass this crown on tonight to another very fortunate young lady, I must say how grateful I am to have been allowed the true honor of being Miss South Carolina. As I traveled over our state and nation, I never could have done it without the help of so many special people. Dawn went on to compete in the Miss America pageant in 1987 and was awarded second runner-up. Not finished yet. The moment has arrived. Miss America 1987 is about to be named, but before we do, are you thinking what I'm thinking? It can't happen a third time. Judges, are you ready? 
great. The second runner-up and winner of an $11,000 scholarship is Dawn Elizabeth Smith, Miss South Carolina. Larry Jean Bell wrote to Dawn while he was in prison. He again asked her for her forgiveness. On October 4th, 1996, after 10 years on death row, 46-year-old Bell died silently in South Carolina's electric chair. He had no parting words as he was strapped into the cold metal chair. Dawn is now a Christian singer-songwriter and a motivational speaker. Her book, Grace So Amazing, A True Story of God's Grace in the Midst of a Life-Shattering Tragedy, is a tribute to Sherry and a testament to the pivotal role that her family's faith played in getting them through Sherry's murder. Sherry's mom, Hilda, passed away in 2003. However, she also authored a book dedicated to Sherry titled The Rose of Sherry about her experience after the kidnapping and murder of her daughter. When asked about Sherry's last letter, her father, Bob, stated, that letter has been more closure to me than any kind of closure that the courts could do for me. Just the fact that she knew where she was going and that she had that kind of faith. <laughs> 